I think it's very important for us to understand that we are now on the knife's edge and our community cases can go either way over the next few weeks. On a nice edge indeed, seven of today's 13 new community cases are linked to the Changi Airport cluster. Vaccination update, younger people will be invited to get their shots from the later half of this month. But festive disappointment, President Halima Yaakob acknowledging that this will once again be a different Hari Raya. Welcome to The Big Story, coming to you live from The Straits Times Newsroom. I'm Olivia Kue. And I'm Harian to demand you can subscribe to The Straits Times channel so you never miss a single episode. Singapore's ongoing COVID-19 fight, one of the big topics brought up in Parliament today with over 20 questions filed. Responding in a ministerial statement, the two co-chairs of the multi-ministry task force, among other things, addressed our vaccination progress, imported cases and community measures. Education Minister Lawrence Wong said community measures in particular remain key in keeping the situation here under control, adding that Singapore has a chance of doing that by the end of the month. I think it's very important for us to understand that we are now on the knife's edge and our community cases can go either way over the next few weeks. We have a chance of getting things under control by the end of the month. But as we know from experience, it only takes one lapse or one irresponsible action for an infection to spread. And that in infection may end up being a super spreader event in the community. So let's all do our part, work from home, cut back on social activities and interactions, and stay home as much as possible during this period. Dr. Leong Ho Nam, an infectious diseases specialist from the Rofi Clinic, joins us now. Welcome back, Doctor. Doctor, we just heard Minister Wong telling Parliament that Singapore has a chance of getting the current COVID-19 situation under control by the end of the month, when the tighter measures are scheduled to end. Now, come May 31st, do you think we should revert to Phase 3 or should it be a more gradual easing? That's the question on everyone's mind, isn't it? Will it, will it not? I like the question. The answer is no. I am betting against it. I think we will all be good just at this point in time, in about a month's time, we will be out of it, just as what Minister Lawrence Wong have said. I'm confident that we can get it right. Number one, we have people who are vaccinated. Number two, we know the drills. It's about the mask and the social distancing. Number three, we have a great Trace Together app now that's running that help us control the spread if we identify any individual. And number four, we have a good cooperative people, people who have ready masks available. So unlike what it was a year ago, we are ready for the challenge. Not that we want the challenge, but we are ready for it. And this is the time. This is the time, Singapore, for you to prove your mettle. This is the time where Trace Together app works and it was designed for this sole purpose. So, Rianto, back to your question. Yes, I'm convinced that we can do it, but if we are only as good as the weakest thing in the society. So get our act together. We will push this virus back away from the shores of Singapore. Right. Um, Doctor, I want to focus on a certain segment of the population. Now, restrictions for indoor gyms, that was raised in Parliament today as well. It's been an ongoing topic since a return to Phase 2 was announced last week. Fitness studios and gyms are high-risk locations because, you know, they are enclosed spaces with many people inside, usually unmasked and are spreading droplets. But we haven't had an outbreak at a gym yet. So weighing both sides, what measures are appropriate for gyms? If you look at the gyms, the structure in which is built, that is the contained, uh, is a contained place. You would have the ventilation will not be uh, suitable for it, as in it's not suitable for prevention of COVID nineteen. It would actually in it would actually create a scenario where you have a lot of transmissions. The only way for gyms to be safe 
is to have it outdoors or at least the doors open widely and the ventilation goes through from one side to the other side so that is not quite feasible and in the context of singapore we love our gyms and air conditioning and the cold temperatures is the perfect recipe mm. it's the perfect recipe for the virus to stay longer now there's a question of it being airborne again we dealt with it previously we say that I don't think so. And after that, we say that possibly in the right scenario, it may be. I just, I think the scientists are relooking at it. The Tan Tock Seng Hospital is looking at it, but we ought to be careful. We shouldn't take any, uh, we should take every single thing seriously. And this includes the gym. Remember, while you're there, while you're exercising, you, are, you won't be wearing a mask, very unlikely to do so. You'll be huffing and puffing and you'll be spreading the virus around. That's the last thing we want. You mm. put the super spreader into the gym, that gym will have a name which you can never wash away, the super spreading gym. Right, well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Leong. We've been speaking with Dr. Leong Ho Nam, infectious diseases specialist from the Rofi Clinic at Mount Elizabeth Novena. 13 new cases in the community were confirmed today. Now, three are currently unlinked, but 10 are linked to previous cases. This includes seven linked to the Changi Airport cluster, which has now grown to 17. The Health Ministry said that out of today's 13 local infections, 8 were already quarantined. 12 imported cases were also reported today. 5 are Singapore citizens or PRs. Well, moving on to Singapore's COVID-19 vaccination progress, from the later half of this month, younger people will get invited to get their shots, but this will be doled out in smaller age bands given the limited vaccine supply. We will be inviting subsequent age bands to receive vaccinations from the later part of May. However, as vaccine supplies continue to be limited, vaccinations will be progressively extended in smaller age bands. We thank everyone for your patience. And if vaccine supplies arrive as scheduled, we will complete the vaccination program by the end of this year. As at May 9th, around 1.2 million people have completed the full vaccination regimen. About two-thirds of those eligible have either been inoculated or booked their vaccination appointments. And Mr Gunn urged the residents to keep encouraging seniors to get their jabs. He also said the Health Sciences Authority is studying whether Pfizer's vaccine can be used for children from 12 to 15 years old. Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna are currently only approved for use in persons aged 16 and 18 years old and above, respectively. The initial data provided by BioNTech, Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna at the time of the pandemic special access route interim authorization did not include data regarding their use in younger populations. The Health Sciences Authority has, has been examining the supplemental data that have since been submitted for the Pfizer vaccine to assess if the vaccine meets safety and efficacy requirements for authorization under PISA for use in adolescents age 12 to 15 years. HSA has also do, uh, will also do so for Moderna vaccine when data is submitted to them. We will share more details when the studies are completed. As for children below 12 years of age, clinical trials are still ongoing and may take more time before enough data is available. Now, for those who cannot be vaccinated against COVID-19, Mr Gan said these individuals are noted in MOH's records and they will be informed when there's a suitable shot for them in the future or when new evidence shows that current vaccines can be administered to them. Mr Gan said as well that authorities are still examining data on booster shots. He encouraged those eligible to, quote, get the two shots first. Despite a tighter screening and quarantine process, Mr Wong said most of Singapore's imported cases are migrant workers in the construction, marine and process sectors, as well as foreign domestic workers. They account for about 40% of imported cases over the past six months. Arrivals at Changi Airport have increased to 1,200 a day in March from 820 last November. But in order to reduce the number of infections from abroad, one option is to shut our borders, an approach taken by larger or resource-rich countries. Mr Wong said though that Singapore is in a completely different position. 
we are little red dot fully plugged into the world and trade and travel are our lifeblood. For us, these are not just good to have, they are existential issues. They are how, as a country, we earn a living and remain relevant to the world. In other words, we can keep our borders closed for a short time, but not over a prolonged duration. We put in place a system of regular testing for those working at the checkpoints and borders. We prioritise vaccination for them and those working in our stay-home notice facilities, the hotels. So vaccination rates are now above 90% for aviation and maritime and 85% for the SHN facilities. We stepped up our testing protocols with pre-departure and on-arrival PCR tests. We tightened our SHN regime and ensured that the hotels we use for SHN have proper infection controls and security measures. The increased inflow of workers from the CMP sectors is still unable to meet Singapore's needs to date, with Mr Wong saying contractors will be hardest hit. Building projects will be delayed and in particular many new BTO projects will be pushed back by at least one year. The manpower shortage will not be confined to the CMP sector. It will have a cascading effect on the whole economy. In fact, any company seeking to bring in workers from higher risk countries will now face considerable delays. The waiting time for any entry approval could be more than six months. And our big concern is that if companies continue to face difficulties or are forced to close, we could then end up with higher unemployment and job losses for Singaporeans. Stresses will be felt in our society too. Singaporeans will find it harder to reunite with their families abroad, and families applying for new foreign domestic workers to care for their children or elderly will have to wait for at least two months. Concluding his speech, Mr Wong called on everyone to look out for each other, stressing that there's no place for discrimination and xenophobia. Avoid spreading falsehoods or unverified information that can cause needless fear or foster divisions and suspicions in our society. Remember, the virus does not respect ethnicity or nationality. This is not a Chinese virus or an Indian variant. This is a global pandemic. The virus and its variants are out there everywhere in the world. So there is no place for discrimination, racism, or xenophobia here in Singapore. We must continue to stand together, look out for each other, so that we can all get through this together. As at yesterday, almost 12,500 people have been tested as part of special testing operations to detect cases linked to the Tan Tok Seng Hospital Cluster. Testing has also been done on 12,000 TTSH staff and 1,000 patients, as well as close to 2,500 people who have been quarantined. Giving an update on the cluster, Mr Gunn highlighted that of the 43 confirmed cases, the nine fully vaccinated cases were either asymptomatic or displayed mild symptoms. While the numbers are too small to draw firm conclusions, the findings do indicate that vaccination provides critical protection even against COVID-19 variants. We know that while vaccination does not eliminate the risk of infection totally, it does provide significant protection against infections and help to reduce the severity of the disease. It is also likely to reduce onward transmission. I therefore urge everyone to get vaccinated when it is offered to you and continue to comply with safe management measures even if you have been vaccinated. This will help to keep all of us safe. Mr Gunn also addressed the recent spate of people shunning or refusing services to healthcare workers. In response to MP Tan Wu Ming raising concerns over the treatment of TTSH staff being told by landlords to move out of their homes, Mr Gunn said that the Health Ministry and COVID-19 Task Force are working to provide alternative accommodations to affected workers. But he clarified that this isn't an excuse for such behaviour and criticised the trend of discrimination against healthcare workers. I know this comes from a small minority of Singaporeans. The great majority is thankful for the sacrifices and contributions of our healthcare workers, including those from Tan Tok Seng Hospital. We know you have been working tirelessly in difficult and uncertain conditions. 
Despite the stressful situation caused by the outbreak, you continue to do your best to care for our patients. I believe I speak for the great majority of Singaporeans, all of us in the Ministry of Health and everyone in this chamber, that we are all solidly behind you. According to Law and Home Affairs Minister K. Shanmugam, groups have been capitalising on Singaporeans' anxiety over jobs to fan the flames of xenophobia and racism, warning that this behaviour will become normalised if Singapore isn't careful. He was responding to MP Murali Pile, who asked how the government will tackle racism arising from the pandemic. Majority of Singaporeans are decent and not racist. But if we continue to fan the flames, of racism, we will get to a more uncomfortable position. There are also websites which deliberately fan racism. They are anti-government, that's perfectly okay, but don't play with race. Comments on these sites, Indians being called cockroaches, rapists, and so on, we should be ashamed that in the name of free speech, we allow such comments. Mr. Shanmugam called on all members of the House to condemn such behaviour and open expressions of racism. When such comments are called out, he added that people can't seek to, just, to justify racism by saying that it's because of government policies, the bad behaviour of a specific racial group, or because of free trade agreements that touch on labour exchanges like the Singapore-India Comprehensive Economic Cooperation Agreement or SICA. At one point, Mr. Shanmugam directed comments at non-constituency MP Leong Man Wai. There have been several canards about Sika, promoted by a whispering campaign. If anyone here believes that Sika is a problem, put it up for a motion, debate it openly, and let's hear whether Singaporeans benefit or lose from it. I'm, I'm looking at you, Mr. Leong. I invite you to put up a motion to debate Sika. You know that most of what is said about Sika is false. And in response, Mr. Leong said that his party, the Progress Singapore Party, is, quote, very interested to take up the Sika issue at some point in time. Now, also in Parliament, Minister of State for Education Sun Shailing revealed there were two bullying incidents per 1,000 primary school students and five such incidents per 1,000 secondary school students last year. These proportions were the same in 2019. Separately, a panel is studying whether road cyclists should be required to ride in a single file at all times or if there should be limits on group sizes for cyclists. These are among the suggestions that the Active Mobility Advisory Panel is considering besides licensing cyclists. And this year alone, the Singapore Food Agency and Health Ministry have investigated 27 incidents of gastroenteritis outbreak involving more than 800 people. 13 incidents involved preschools and another four affecting other educational institutions. In other local headlines, in a Hari Raya Ideal Fitri message today, President Halima Yaakob said it's unfortunate that once again Muslims will celebrate the festival under COVID-19 curbs. She noted that some are understandably disappointed by the recent tightening of measures, but added these are necessary moves to save the lives of Singaporeans. I too was looking forward to hosting my children and their families. But I hope that we also understand that these measures are necessary to protect all Singaporeans given the emergence of new virus variants and the increase in the number of local community cases. So let us all do our part and work together to overcome this pandemic. I wish all Muslims Selamat Hari Raya Aidil Fitri Ma'af, Zahir dan Batin. To help gyms and fitness studios defray costs in light of the stricter rules for these businesses, Sport Singapore has set aside $18 million. $7.7 million will go towards a sport and fitness operating grant. Eligible businesses can tap this to pay for overhead costs like rental and salaries. 
over 30 places like malls, offices, schools and places of worship have rolled out automated safe entry gantries to manage visitor access and contact tracing. These gantries incorporate the latest safe entry gateway device which means visitors can simply tap their trace together token or app to check in. It was revealed yesterday that 1,200 users have requested to opt out of the program and for their data to be removed. And this comes as trace together check-ins at public venues become mandatory from next Monday. Beyond our borders, the US has approved the use of Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine in children aged 12 to 15. In September, Pfizer expects to have safety and efficacy data for children between 2 and 11 years old and plans to ask for approval for that age group. China's population growth in the decade to 2020 has slipped to a record low. According to the once-a-decade census, the population increased 5.38% to 1.41 billion last year, narrowly missing its 1.42 million target. And this has put pressure on Beijing to ramp up incentives to couples to have more children and avert an irreversible decline. Well, those are our top stories for today. For more news and videos, visit straitstimes.com and subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. Once again, I'm Harianta Diman with Olivia Kuei. Join us tomorrow for more stories on A Big Story.